Hello and welcome to today's KDP University's At Home with Rachel McLean. I'm Trisha, and for the past six years I've moved around Amazon Books teams learning the business so I can share it with authors. Prior to coming to Amazon, I worked as a graphic artist, project manager, and educator. Currently, I'm privileged to work on the KDP University team, helping authors use the KDP website to make the most of their author journey. But enough about me, we're all here to talk to Rachel. Rachel McLean is the author of two best-selling crime series, the Detective Zoe Finch series and the Dorset crime series. The Corf Murder Castles, book one in the Dorset crime series, was the winner of the Kindle Storyteller Award for 2021 and has received numerous bestseller badges. She's been publishing since 2017 and is a proud indie author. Welcome, Rachel. Hello. Thank you for inviting me on. Absolutely. So did I totally butcher the pronunciation of your book? Um, you, you mixed up two words. So it's the Corf Castle Murders. Okay. But you got my name right. And most people pronounce my name McLean, which to be fair is how it's spelt. Right. And um, I have family um, in Canada and they pronounce it McLean. So it's not uncommon for people to pronounce it that way. <laughs> All right. So so I, I'm 50 percent. So that's good. I'll take that this morning. <laughs> yeah. All right. So let's get started by talking a little bit about how you got into writing and publishing. Yeah, well. I think like a lot of writers, I've always loved writing. I started writing when I was at primary school. Um, I actually wrote a short novel when I was about 10, um, very short, but it was a serialized story. And then got the creativity bashed out of me at secondary school, really, where I was expected to write essays and more analytical type of stuff. Mm -hmm. But then in every job that I held from that point on, I was always the person on the team who would be the writer, the person who would be um asked about possessive apostrophes and things like that and people would ask me to edit their words or rewrite them or rejig them or whatever um and then i didn't really think much about writing fiction until i went on a writing course through work it was a business writing course but i didn't actually have any business writing i was working on at that time because i was there to trial the course as the person responsible for commissioning it um, and we had to mind map uh, a writing project so I mind mapped a novel and that then became the first novel that I published in 2017 on KDP and that took me 15 years to write but I'm a lot faster now. I would hope so. Yes. <laughs> so 15 years that's a that's a huge kind of drawn out process what took you so long was it? <laughs> Good was question. Was um, it just well, second I, guessing or I'm sorry? Well, it was partly because it was really bad and it needed so much editing, but it was also partly because life got in the way. So I wrote the first draft when I was pregnant with my oldest son. Um, he actually turned 17 yesterday. Mm -hmm. So that tells you how long ago it was. And I thought you know, I'd written that first draft. I thought I've got maternity leave coming up. I can use that to write. <laughs> didn't realize quite how much work babies involved. So I didn't do any writing for quite a while. And then when he was three, I joined a writer's group and thought, right, I'll get back into it again. And then discovered I was pregnant with my second son and then life got in the way once again. So I had some quite big gaps from the writing. And then when Jamie was 10, so that would be um, seven years ago, I met another writer at an event. It was a coding event for kids that both of our kids were at. So I met Heidi Goody, who's an indie author. And she told me about the writers group that she was a member of. Turned out it was the same writers group I'd tried to go to before. And I started attending meetings. My kids were old enough then for it not to be such a challenge to get to meetings and spend time writing. And I found that going to those regular meetings twice a month was the kick that I needed to, to get me to actually write regularly. So I went back to that manuscript, uh, gave it some very substantial editing uh, with the help of a friend who was professional editor. Uh, I think probably 10% of the original manuscript stayed in place by the time I published it. 
Um, and that since then I've attended the vast majority of meetings of the writers group. I still go and I've not stopped writing since. Mm -hmm. That support is really, really key in order to make sure that you're writing. We get tons of questions saying, how do you get over writer's block? How do you, you know, when you're not motivated, how do you move forward? And every time I talk to an author, they bring up a, some sort of writer's group. Yeah, absolutely. I find that my writer's group is useful in many different ways. The first one is that they give feedback on your on your work. So I regularly submit the opening chapters to my books and I ask them one question. Does this make you want to read on? Because that's the most important thing for me with the opening chapter. And I find that feedback is really useful. Um, mm. I also in the earlier days, I submitted full manuscripts and we would have full manuscript reviews where an entire meeting is given over to somebody's book. Uh, I don't do that now because I write too fast to be able to submit them and get it within the schedule of the meetings. But that at the beginning was incredibly useful because there were people there who were much more experienced at writing novels than me, who knew more about how to structure a full length novel and could give me advice. So, And it, it's also fun talking to other writers about writing. Those people are my friends now. I really enjoy spending time with them. So, yeah, to anybody who's not a member of a writing group, I would strongly recommend joining one. Now, your first novel and your first series, you've mentioned to me, didn't quite fit into a genre comfortably. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I wrote a couple of series. So the first series was the Division Bell trilogy, which was dystopian political thrillers. And I also wrote the Village trilogy, which were post-apocalyptic psychological thrillers, um, both of which are trying to mash up two genres. And they were books that I really wanted to write. They were, there were concepts in them that I felt strongly about and really wanted to explore. And I published them. They did okay to start with. Um, I ran adverts for them and was managed to make those profitable. But over time, I found that I just got through the potential audience for those books really quickly because there weren't many people who wanted to read those mashups. And so in January 2020, I thought to myself, I really wanted to write something that I knew would find a bigger audience. And I looked at where my strengths were, what I could write a series in, because obviously marketing a series is so much easier because you've got read through to account for a lot of the sales. And I like writing suspense and I like writing twists. Um, and it made sense to turn my hand to crime. So then I started writing the D.I. Zoe Finch series. I actually wrote the first book deep in lockdown, sitting in my camper van on my front drive to get a bit of peace and quiet from the fact that the house was full of Zoom lessons and things going on. Um, and, um, and it was so quiet out there that it was very easy to concentrate because nobody was walking past in the first lockdown. There, was, there were very few people even out and about. I uh, live on quite a quiet road. So I wrote that book then, launched it in July last year, having already um, having already finished the first draft of the second one at that point, so I knew I could keep going. And that was successful on pre-order. So I knew I had something. Uh, I had about a thousand pre-orders, which for me at the time was vastly more than I'd ever had before. I'd only ever had about 20 or 30 pre-orders in the past. So I knew I was onto something. And then when the first one came out, pre-orders of the second were higher um, first sold really well, um, did really well with KU page reads and I haven't looked back. Um, December I was last year I was able to go full time and I'm now absolutely loving it. Full time writer. Nice. Well congratulations on that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, how did you decide that it, you know, that how did you decide what your readers wanted? How did you decide um, where you needed to be? I did a lot of writing. market research and I think that's something that we often shy away from as writers. We write um, the book of our heart, we write the book that's, that's burning to get out of us and that, that we're inspired to write and there's definitely a place for that but I think if you want to maximise your chances of finding an audience and making a living from your writer you need to understand your genre. So I researched two aspects really of the crime genre, one being the tropes and what reader expectations were from the stories and the characters. 
and the other being the market and who my comps were um, and therefore where I needed to position my books and who I needed to target with my advertising. And I used Amazon ads with laser focus targeting. I was actually targeting specific books uh, mm-hmm. in order to make sure make sure that I sort of fed the AI with the right kind of data about who it should be recommending my books to. And now the vast majority of my sales are organic. They're not driven directly by my ads. And I can see from my also bots, both on my author page and on my book pages, that those also bots are exactly the people I wanted them to be and, and who I targeted as my comps when I started out. So that work I did at the beginning and that I continue to do, um, making sure that that the system knows exactly where my books fit uh, mm-hmm. has been really successful for me. Now, to help out other authors, you've actually written a book about this, and it's releasing in the new year. Can you talk a little bit about your book that's coming up? Yeah, um, I've got a proof copy here. It's called Five Steps to Author Success, and it details the five main steps that I took to go from being somebody who two years ago was selling a few books a day. I was literally selling a few copies across all my books each day. Um, to somebody now who sells a few thousand every day. So I sell at least a couple of thousand books every day. And I that wasn't luck. It wasn't fluke. It was something I set out to achieve and that I took strategic steps to identify what my market was. Um, and I did the marketing started before I wrote a word with that market research. So the first, well, actually, the second step in, in that book is about the research. The first step is about mindset, because I think um, this was something that for me, I'd been working on for a while beforehand. But I think often what can make the difference between somebody who writes as a hobby and somebody who writes as a living is the way that you think about your books and the idea of your books being products so that you're comfortable with creating packaging for them, i.e. the cover and the blurb that is geared towards the market rather than what you personally might feel is nice um, and that you can emotionally disengage yourself from them as well and see them as, as a product that belong to the readers once they're out there really rather than belonging to you. Okay. Um, so I know that we've got a lot of um, individuals who, once they publish, they're at a loss as to what to do next. You know, how do you start marketing? What does that look like? Um, can you talk a little bit about your marketing plan? Yeah, well, when I started marketing the Zoe Finch books, I was effectively starting from nothing because although I had a small readership for my other books, they weren't necessarily crime readers. They were very different books. And so I was targeting a completely different market. So I was starting from scratch and I started with Facebook ads because it's much easier to get Facebook to deliver your ads at the beginning. You have to be really careful because Facebook will spend all of your budget regardless of how effective your ads are. So Mm -hmm. I started with a really low budget of uh, three pounds, about four dollars a day. And I tested, I tested and tested and tested. I I already had uh, Mark Dawson's Facebook ads for authors course and I followed that and did a lot of my own tweaking and and working on optimizing my ads. And then as those were successful, I upped the budget. But the the downside of Facebook ads is that you can't target very well. So uh, the targeting I was doing on Facebook ads was very broad, which meant that it wasn't helping me to feed the algorithm with that information about who my comps were. So I used BookBub ads to help with that. And BookBub is great for being able to target specific authors. So I, once the book was launched, when it was a new release, I advertised it via BookBub ads. I didn't make a profit on those, but that wasn't my goal. My goal was to actually seed sales through picking up the right readers. And I could see that my also bought started to change as I did that. Mm -hmm. And then when I reached the point where I could do so profitably, I started running Amazon ads um, because Amazon ads, indie authors will always say that Amazon ads are really, really hard to get them even serving in the first place. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason for that is because clicks can be expensive. 
But the other reason is that Amazon, when deciding whether to serve your ads, doesn't only know how much you're bidding, it also knows how well those books are already performing. So your ads are more likely to be served if, you're, if your book is already selling. Mm -hmm. So I deliberately held back on the Amazon ads until I already had a pre-established level of sales. And then I knew that those ads had a much higher chance of being served. I now use Amazon ads as my main advertising platform because it's much easier to scale on Amazon ads. I find that Facebook ads, once I go past a budget of about 40 pounds a day, a bit less at this time of year because things are more expensive at Christmas. But once I go past that sort of budget on each series, the cost per click starts to go up to a point where it's just not worth spending that extra money. Mm -hmm. But with Amazon ads, as long as I keep an eye on my targets and I keep tweaking my bids and looking at different targets and what I'm bidding on them, I can scale my Amazon ads. So I, I spend a significant amount of money on Amazon ads every month. And I now target, I don't target specific ASINs anymore, specific books, because that only reached, that did get to the point where it sort of tapped out the, the opportunities mm -hmm. to deliver those ads. But what I do now is I target categories. And I find that for my books, that works better than targeting keywords. So I will target the categories that my books are shelved in and mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, I'll have different bids for different categories depending on how competitive they are. And that for me is, is working very well. Good. So that brings up a, a new question that authors always struggle with is how do you figure out those categories? Um, what you know how do you identify the categories that make sense for your book yeah i think for my book it's my books it's quite straightforward because there are a lot of relevant categories there's a lot of subcategories in the crime genre um so part of the challenge is is sort of sticking to just 10 and um identifying which are the best ones so what i did was before i started writing each series I looked at my comps and which categories they were in. I also looked at what rank you needed to achieve to get within the top 10 of each category. So for each of my series, I make sure, I make sure that my two series aren't in all the same categories, because to be honest, they shouldn't be, because there are differences between the series. But also it means each book one can be a bestseller in a different category. Because if I had them all in the same categories, I couldn't be a bestseller with more than one book. So I um, I have different categories and I, I am targeting categories that are relevant, mm -hmm. but that also I have a good chance of actually achieving some success and getting a good rank in. And I, I think for the last oh, five months, I've pretty much permanently had a bestseller badge on on the two first in series. Um, Deadly Wishes, the Zoe Finch one, sometimes that drops off because that's an older book. But The Call of Castle Murders has had a bestseller badge in at least one category almost since it was released in July. Um, that um, felt like a risk when I launched that series because I was already doing well with the first series, but it has really paid off. Uh, I did it deliberately because I wanted people to have more than one entry point to my work. But The Corf Castle Murders has by far been my best selling book. It's been incredibly successful. And of course, it won me the Kindle Storyteller Award. So I'm very right. glad about it. <laughs> <laughs> so I was just going to mention that we had some questions come in around that, um, around, you know, why do you think that, that, that it won? Why do you think it did so well? Oh, that's a very difficult question to answer without asking very awkward questions of the judges. Um, <laughs> I think, I mean, it, one of the things I really like about the Kindle Storyteller Award is, in, is to become shortlisted, to become a finalist, it's largely based on reader response. So the reviews and to some extent sales levels, but not necessarily because you don't have to be a bestseller in order to become a finalist. But the the response that readers have got to those books is, is really important. And I love that because it's quite unusual amongst awards in that you've got that aspect, the reader engagement, but then you've got judges for the, the, the finalists and, and mm -hmm. for deciding on the winner. Um, and interestingly when we actually had the awards ceremony claire balding was presenting the award and she ran, talked through each of the books talked about what she'd enjoyed about them and mine was the one she was the least glowing about and i thought oh 
oh, I really, I stand no chance here. It's like, she said nice things about it, but they weren't amazingly nice things. And then when she announced that I'd won, I realized that was because she was saving those nice things until she <laughs> announced that I'd won. And it was a genuine shock when I won. So in answer to the question, I really don't know because the, the other books were great. I read them all. There were some really good books I enjoyed. I had my own theory as to which one would win and it wasn't mine, um, but I was overjoyed when I did win. It was wonderful. Wonderful. Well, congratulations. I mean, that's such a big achievement. Um, so we've got some questions coming in. So I figure we'll switch to those. Um, so we have a question about your website. Um, so when we talk about marketing, a lot of authors have their website, they have their newsletter list. Um, at what stage, because you, you published in 2017, did you create a website right away? Did you build, did you have a newsletter list right away? How did you build this out? Yeah, I've, I've got a bit of an advantage there because in my previous job, I was a web developer. So building a website was something that came very easily to me. But I have revamped my website a couple of times since I first set it up. So initially it was branded to fit with my first series. And then I made it uh, more generic because I had more than one series out. And then when I launched the Zoe Finch series, I rebranded it before that was launched in order to make it more consistent with my crime books. So the, the fonts, for example, that I use on the covers, I make sure that they're um, on the website as well, or as, or as close as you can get of the mm -hmm. web fonts, aren't always exactly the same. So my, my website really has one job to do, and that is to get signups to my newsletter. Uh, it does do other things. It provides, um, you can buy signed paperbacks on it, you can find out more about the books, but the main aim of the website um, and I think this should be the main aim of any author's website, is to get sign-ups to my newsletter. So the, the front page is a big banner that is the artwork from my reader magnet, which is a prequel novella, and a big button that you click on to go through to a, a page with a form where all you do is type in your email address and it automatically adds you to the newsletter and then you receive that reader magnet. So I, I'm not entirely sure how many signups I'm getting through my website and how many I'm getting through my back matter um, at the back of my books. I'm about to actually change my links so that I can, so I've got I've got different links and I can actually monitor that because I've just been using the same link wherever. Um, but um, it's been suggested to me, I'm, I'm doing one of Tammy Lebrecht's courses, she's an expert on newsletters, and she suggested that I use different links in the back of different books so that I can track which books they're coming from and I can also track my website. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, I think the website is important, but I would say for a fiction author, don't spend too much time on it, certainly don't worry about having a blog or that sort of thing. Um, it's mainly there to, to hoover up newsletter subscribers. How often do you send out your newsletter? Every week. Okay. So I send out, it's designed to not to sell books so much as to form a relationship with my readers mm -hmm. and to develop that. So it's a chatty newsletter with updates about what kind of writing things I've been doing. I go on a lot of research trips for my books. One of the reasons I write about Dorset is because I love going there and it gives me an excuse to go down to Dorset and take photographs of my locations. And whenever I do that, I share photographs and stories about where I've been with my newsletter. And I'll, I'll share updates on what I'm writing. I'll sometimes send them excerpts from upcoming novels. So if when I've got a launch the week before, they'll get the first chapter as a sort of to whet their appetites. And then on the, the week of release that they'll get a very, very simple email with no images at all and just one link that tells them the book is out and click here to buy it because I want to maximize deliverability for that email. So that's why I keep other links and photos and any other media out of that newsletter mm -hmm. because that. Um, so I'm told I haven't actually measured it, but uh, the, the theory is that it's more likely to find its way to people's inboxes that way. So we had a question come in about uh, English and very specifically the global English. Do you use a global English or do you use the um, 
British English or do you Americanize it in order to broaden your audience? How do you make that choice? I use British English because my books are set in Britain and they are very British. And to be honest, crime is quite an unusual genre in that there are police procedurals set on both sides of the Atlantic, but there isn't a huge market in America for the books that I write. There's a bigger market for cozy mysteries um, and a different sort of worldview of, of what an English mystery might be. But the sort of gritty police procedurals I write doesn't have a very big market in the, in the US for, for one set in Britain. Although mm -hmm. I'm finding the Dorset books have a bigger market than my book set in Birmingham because nobody outside the UK has heard of Birmingham in the West Midlands. I, I tell people it's up the road from Stratford, <laughs> obviously Shakespeare's birthplace, which everybody's heard of. Stratford is tiny compared to Birmingham, but it's it's better known. Uh, but the, the fact that I don't have a big audience in the US isn't a problem for me because it's a massive genre in the UK. Mm -hmm. And I, I more than um, happily um, get a, a very good audience in the UK. So I, I think about 95, somewhere between 90 and 95 percent of my sales are in the UK. And I sell almost as many in Australia and Canada as I do in the US, despite the fact that those are smaller markets. OK. Um, Kate wants to know roughly how many category ads do you have running at any one time? Um, I have. I have four campaigns running. So for each series, I will have two campaigns running. And one of those is for book one in the series. And that's where most of my budget goes. And the other one is for all of the subsequent books in the series. And I run that so that there will be, on some instances of the ads, you'll see more than one book. So you can see that it's a series. Um, mm -hmm. But the, the book one is the main one, and that's the one where I actually get the sales, because I think often when people click on the ads for the other books, they then actually go and buy book one. They don't buy the book that's been advertised. So when I'm calculating my profitability, I, I look at them as a whole. And then within each of those ads, I will have um, five or six ad sets running, each of which is a category that I'm targeting. And I use separate ad sets for each category because I've found by doing that rather than by targeting multiple categories within one ad set, I get better deliverability. I don't know whether it's because they're competing with each other if they're in the same ad set. I'm not entirely sure how that works, but I, I find that um, they weren't delivering when I was setting up multiple categories within one ad set. So I'll have five or six ad sets in each campaign and each of those targets one category. Okay. You mentioned that your two series are, um, although semi-related, are they in the same world? I mean, I, they're in the same world because they're both in England, but <laughs> uh, but do they have characters that work yes. out of the cross? Okay. They do. I like to carry characters across between series, partly because I enjoy writing those characters, mm -hmm. uh, and also because it readers love it. Readers like the fact that there's somebody to follow who will be going through to the next series. So Leslie Clark, who's the protagonist in my Dorset Crime books, she was the boss of Zoe Finch, who was the protagonist in my D.I. Zoe Finch books in Birmingham. Mm -hmm. And I really enjoyed writing her. I had a lot of fun writing her. She, she takes no prisoners. She's quite no nonsense. Um, and I, she was just very entertaining to, to have in my head. So when I decided to, to set a series in Dorset, I, I worked it in the plot. So she was getting seconded to Dorset, um, moved her down there, created more of a backstory for her and family and so forth. And I've been writing about her in that series. But Zoe occasionally comes to Dorset and helps Leslie with cases that there's a particularly sensitive case that Leslie doesn't want to involve her own team in. So she gets Zoe's input on it. So and readers really like the fact that Zoe comes back. Um, right. And then I'm planning a new series for this year, which will be set in Scotland. So it'll be a team who are based in Edinburgh, but travel all over Scotland. So I get to see lots of beautiful scenery for my research. And that will feature a protagonist who has already been a minor character in both the Zoe Finch and the Dorset crime series. And I'm bringing in, she will have a sidekick who was Zoe's sidekick. So he'll be moving up to Scotland 
because his wife's Scottish, so he's got a good excuse to move to Scotland. So he'll be moving up to Scotland and taking part in that. And that was actually an idea I got from a reader, because when I sent out a newsletter saying I'm planning a series set in Scotland and it'll feature a character from the existing books, one of my readers emailed me and said, oh, is it going to be so-and-so? Because I really like him. And I thought, oh, so do I. Oh, OK, I'll put him in as well. <laughs> so, so, yeah, and that's one of the great things about being indie. You can react very directly to reader feedback and reader ideas in a way that's much harder if you're working with a publisher with, with those sort of time scales and constraints. Talking about time scales, how often do you publish? I publish every two to three months. Mm -hmm. So what I tend to do is when I'm at the beginning of a series, I will publish a bit quicker. So the Dorset Crime series, I actually save those up and publish them all within four weeks. So I had a two week gap between the first three. And then after that, I'll have three month gaps between books. But it actually takes me two months to write a book. But I publish my regular schedule is slightly longer than those two months because mm -hmm. that gives me the time where, where I can bunch up books at the beginning of the series and have shorter pre-order periods to maximize the launch of those books. When you do your research, we've been talking about research and, and, and you speak mainly about researching the area. How much with a crime procedural, I'm assuming there's a lot of background and knowledge of police procedure that you need in order to make it authentic. What kind of research do you do in order to to have it authentic? Yeah, I did a lot of research before I started writing any of the books. So I, I actually signed up for a couple of open university courses. You can do um, modules within their courses um, as a, a MOOC, a mass open online course, I think that stands for. And I, I signed up for a few of those. So particularly about forensics, I learned a lot about. Um, I bought the textbooks that the police use when they're taking their exams on police procedure and on crime. So I've got the textbook with all of the different crimes listed and what the potential uh, punishments are and so forth. Um, I buy um, memoirs by people who've worked in the police and pathologists and forensic psychologists. I've got textbooks, so forensics and pathology textbooks, which are quite gruesome in, in places. And then the best thing is that one of my beta readers is a retired detective. So he will then read each book and tell me if I've got things wrong. So I try and get things as accurate as I can before that. But then he will tell me if I've got things wrong. And sometimes he'll say, yeah, I'm going to give you artistic license on this one because it is necessary for the story. But let's try and explain. Let's try and find a way around it. And sometimes he'll say, no, you really can't do this. <laughs> you have to change it. Uh, but it's really useful having his input. How did you find him? He volunteered. So he was reading my books. Uh, he read the first Zoe Finch book, Deadly Wishes, and then he signed up to my newsletter. He replied to one of my emails saying, I'm a retired detective. I'd love to, uh, I spotted a minor error in your first book. Um, I'd be, you know, I'd love to read the books and give feedback um, if you'd like me to. And he didn't know what a beta reader was and the fact that that, that happens. And I, I bit his hand off. I said, yes, absolutely. I'll send you a copy before they're published and you can correct them for me. So I'm, yeah, really pleased I've got him. And he's he's also a big fan. He recommends my books to all his family and friends. And uh, it's, it's great to have that input. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's important. We always get questions about reviews and sales and that word of mouth is huge for marketing. So how, how is it, how do you build that relationship with those readers so they do exactly that, tell all their families and friends and everybody <laughs> about the book? I think the, the first way to do that is to write books that they love enough to want to recommend to people. But the other is keeping in contact with people so they don't forget you exist between releases. So having a regular newsletter helps with that. And I'm very active on Facebook. I find Facebook is where my readers tend to be. I've got a rapidly growing Facebook page and I post I'll post news about releases and that kind of thing. But I'll also I'll post funny photos of um, locations from my books and I'll post the kind of comments about my characters that only make sense if you've read the books and that talk about the characters as if they're real. Um, so I'll take a photo of, of 
a crime scene and talk about how Leslie will feel about having to go to this crime scene. Um, and that gets a really good response from readers because they get to share in this, this shared joke about the characters and who they are and how they respond to things. And that that works really well. And I really enjoy doing it. It's so much fun when people start talking about the, the characters that you created as if they're real. It's mm -hmm. such a good feeling. So Facebook, any of the other social media sites or you find that Facebook works for you? I use Twitter and Instagram. Uh, but I find that I don't get as much engagement on those, mm -hmm. but I, I do use them. I largely am interacting with other writers on uh, Twitter and Instagram as well as with readers, whereas with Facebook, it's predominantly readers. Okay. Uh, so I, I use them and I, I enjoy using those, but Facebook is definitely where I get the most engagement. And that will vary with your genre and your audience, but my audience is definitely the demographic that's on Facebook. Okay. So Jean wants to know, with all this studying of crimes and police procedures, do you ever have trouble sleeping? Um. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> well, I think I think the thing about um, writing crime, and part of the reason I feel that crime has done so well in the last couple of years, crime fiction, not crime, but crime fiction, um, is that although there are really nasty things that happen in crime books and you really don't want to have moved to Dorset at the same time as um, my DCI Leslie Clark did because the murder rate suddenly shot up. Um, but there's always a sense of justice at the end. The crime is always solved. The killer is always brought to justice and it's wrapped up. Mine aren't entirely wrapped up because I have ongoing story threads that go through the entire series that tend to be more personal. They're not about their personal lives they're professional but they're more they've got an aspect of the personal to them as well so they might be pertinent the relationships between the people on the force and things that people have done and that sort of thing police corruption and so forth but mm -hmm. the the mystery within each book is solved and wrapped up and concluded and i think that that helps us all sleep a little bit easier at night right Right, we have we have it tied up in a nice little bow, whereas life usually isn't that that generous. Yes, absolutely. Um, do you pay your beta readers? No, What's I your don't. Protocol. Okay. No, they're all um, they're all people who have volunteered, who are people who are keen to read the books anyway, and they are eager to read the books before anybody else gets a chance to. So I, right. I don't pay my beta readers, no. Um, do you have a staff or is this a one person show? Um, I, well, my, my son, my oldest son is actually an employee of my company. He does some, um, he does some of my uploading and advertising and he's done quite a lot of data analysis for me. Uh, that's tailed off a little bit lately because he's now in the sixth form doing A-levels and he's very busy with that. But over the summer, and during lockdown, when he was homeschooling, he was doing you know, Zoom lessons and so forth, but he wasn't quite as busy. He was helping me out with that, which was was great because it gave us a chance to work together and for him to get to know my business better. But then for other things where I need to hire in help, I don't employ people. I don't have a staff, but I do have. Obviously, I work with an editor and proofreader and people like that. I've just hired a VA, so I'm getting used to working with her and working out what to pass over to her and that will grow over time so at the moment it's purely admin tasks and and sort of file management and that kind of thing but over time i'd like to have her get more involved with the publishing side of things so that she's setting up books on the kdp dashboard for me um, and in particular um, working with the acx dashboard because it can take a while to upload audio, audio files Mm -hmm. And I often I always get really bored while I'm doing it and think, oh, I could be writing. <laughs> so it would be good <laughs> to have somebody do that for me. Who does your audio? Do you do you narrate your own audio? I, do, I definitely don't narrate my own audio. Uh, I hire a narrator called Jan Kramer, who I found because she narrates one of my comps books. 
and I tracked her down online and asked her if she'd be available to hire to do my books and she said yes and she's she's so good at it she really brings the books to life I find I listen to her narration and it's almost like listening to a different book she adds that extra element to it and I get a lot of really positive feedback about her narration so we're currently we're working through the books so we've got audio books for all of the Zoe Finch series and the first Dorset crime book the Corfe Castle Murders and we're now working through the rest of the Dorset crime series because obviously um, audible audio narration takes a while and in my case so far it's followed after publication of the ebook what I'm planning to do with my next series is delay the publication of the ebook a little so that I can at least attempt to have um, consecutive um, not consecutive um, simultaneous release mm -hmm. across all formats but we shall see that can be quite challenging so what formats are you publishing in right now when you do a release is it just ebook or is it ebook paperback or is it ebook paperback hardcover ebook and paperback at the moment i'm working with an artist on producing hardback covers for the dorset crime books so i'm going to be going down to dorset in january and meeting with her to look at artwork for those and what i want to create are something a little bit special so obviously i'm commissioning custom artwork for them which will be paintings or illustrations of the the settings of the beautiful landscapes in dorset and I want to make those into really beautiful objects that become collector's items and they, they might be limited edition. So, uh, yeah, I'll be working on those in the new year. And that's, that's something quite exciting to be commissioning an artist, something I've never done before. Uh, who does your covers otherwise? I do my own covers, uh, which I know is unusual. But I, um, when I was a, a web designer and developer, I also um, did graphic design. So I'm trained in graphic design and mm -hmm. have done quite a lot of that over the years. So it was something that I was quite comfortable with doing. I think if I, if I worked with a genre where you had illustrated covers or anything like that, so say if I was in fantasy, I definitely wouldn't do my own covers. But for mm -hmm. crime, if you've got graphic design um, knowledge, they're not as complicated to produce as some other genres covers can be mm -hmm. and they they seem to work despite the fact I do them myself uh, they certainly nobody ever everybody gives me very positive feedback on the covers and you know I was very keen to make sure that they they look professional right. and that they sell the books right because they're 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 that 10 second grab your reader kind of uh when you, so the ads appear, right? You Your ads pop up, but that cover is what kind of drives that clickability and that sales and then conversion. Absolutely, and I work hard to make sure that the branding across my books is really tight. Mm -hmm. So I use the same font for my author name across series. And then within each series, I have a template for the cover with the mm -hmm. same layout, same fonts and everything but I will swap out the image and the, change the colors and the gradients and so forth. But mm -hmm. it's, you know, they look very similar when you lay them all out next to each other. And that's really important. And that's something that's a real bonus of being indie because sometimes you do see traditionally published books where that hasn't been done. Maybe it might be sometimes because different imprints have published different books, but sometimes it just seems to happen anyway. <laughs> and I don't understand why. Uh, but obviously branding is so important so that people can instantly look at your book and know what it is. And that mm -hmm. if they've read another one, they'll know that they're going to get a similar experience. Right. Um, are you in Kindle Unlimited? Are your books in Kindle Unlimited? I am, yes. I, I make about 60% of my income from Kindle Unlimited. So for me, it's definitely worth doing. I know that some people are concerned about um, the risk of not being wide and not tapping other markets, but because my market is so heavily in the UK and Kindle Unlimited is big in the UK, it works for me. And it's something that um, if I was ever to pull out of, I would lose a big chunk of my readership. I've, I've had people email me who signed up to Kindle Unlimited specifically so they could download all my books and read them all. So that's great. Yeah. <laughs> I guess we'll have to put you on staff. <laughs> um, where did you find your editor? I've 
Um, I've, I've had a few editors over the years and Joel Hames, my current editor, is somebody I met. Now, where did, I think Joel and I met in various different places through other authors, uh, but we'd known each other for a while. He's, he's a writer as well. And he writes um, crime and thrillers, um, but with a slightly more literary bent than me, which actually makes him a great editor because his understanding of punctuation and grammar is better than mine. Um, and he was a beta reader for Deadly Wishes, the first Zoe Finch book. And my then editor, I wasn't entirely happy with the edits because I was deliberately taking a, a route with my writing that was designed to be more accessible and to hit a mass market. Mm -hmm. And he was making edits that were designed to make the book a little more literary. And I really didn't want that. And he he made suggestions that showed that he didn't really understand the market that I was aiming at. So I was in the market for a new editor at that point. Joel did a beta read of that book and it was such a good beta read. It was almost like an edit. So I said to him, do you want to do that again with the next book and I'll pay you and you'll do a bit more. Um, <laughs> so actually do an edit and he did and that worked really well. So I've, I've been with Joel ever since. So Joel has now edited, I think, 12 books for me. And we work really well together. He's got a fantastic memory for what's happened earlier on in my series, because I'm now getting to the point where, although I'm five books with the writing into my Dorset Crime series, I'm actually 12 books into this world because there's six books in the Zoe Finch series and there's always already also a prequel novella, which is um, my reader magnet on my website. And I can't remember what happened in the earlier books, but Joel's really good at remembering that. And he will spot those errors and correct them in the books, as well as obviously making the books better and editing the, the writing as well. So we work really well together. How do you determine when you get the feedback back from your beta readers and from your editor, how do you determine what you're actually going to integrate into the novel and what you're like, well, thank you for that feedback, but I think we need to go in this direction? Um, with my editor, I integrate almost everything. Mm -hmm. So I will, I'm, I'm doing that at the moment. I'm working through uh, The Millionaire Murders, which is Dorset Crime, book five. And I will work through, because we use track changes in Word, and I will work through his edits. And I will only do anything with the ones that I don't quite want to keep as he's done them. So. I might actually want to make more of an edit than he has or change a different sentence instead. Or occasionally I'll disagree because um, it's, it's a standing joke between us that we disagree on the use of the subjunctive. He wants to use the subjunctive because it's grammatically correct. I don't because I'm trying to reach this mass market, mass audience that don't aren't interested in subjunctives. So things like that, I will occasionally um, sort of revert back to slightly less literary um, prose. Uh, but generally, I would say 99% of his edits I will accept. So once I've worked through the book, sometimes he's made comments. So I need to actually do some, you know, do some editing myself and, and write some some new content or change some content. But I'll work through the book. And then once I've gone through and made any tweaks, I will then do accept all changes. And then that becomes the version of the book that goes to beta readers and mm -hmm. to the proofreader. Um, and I um, that then takes it's about three weeks from that point until publication, although I give myself four weeks. I like to work buffers in. So with this feedback, um, some authors feel that their books are almost their babies, right? So they're <laughs> they're very precious. They've they've dumped their heart and souls in this. So how do you manage that feedback without getting your feelings hurt? I think once you've written 20 books, which is where I'm at now, you, you get past that because one book is less of a big deal in your head than when you've got 20 of them than it is when you've written one. And my advice to anybody who's struggling with receiving feedback or with disengaging themselves emotionally from their book is to write the next one because you then become obsessed with the next one and you don't worry quite so much about the first one. The reality is most people's first books will get negative reviews and negative feedback and your star rating is going to improve the more books that you write because you'll get better. 
and in a way I'm actually quite glad that my first books weren't very well targeted in terms of the marketing because it gave me the opportunity to learn to to write those to write better books and to hone my craft before I had a vast audience reading them and seeing how bad some of them were um, I mean, they get good reviews they're not you know they're not bad I wouldn't have published them if they were bad but I'm much prouder of the, the more recent books. And that's one of the reasons that I like to launch a new series every year so that people have got a new point to jump into my work, which reflects my current writing ability rather than how I could write a couple of years ago. And all of that feeds into the marketability and the saleability of not only the series that you're launching, but your other series as well. Definitely. So I'll find that people find me either via Zoe Finch or Dorset Crime, and then they'll often read the other series after they've finished what's available in that one. So I've got you know, twice as many opportunities for people to find me and twice as many series to be advertising. Now, you talked a little bit when we were talking about advertising, you talked a little bit about first in series. How do you how, how's your advertising differ for your first in series versus your subsequent releases? It differs massively in that the vast majority of my marketing is aimed at the first in series. So I have ads constantly running to my first in series. So I've already talked about my Amazon ads and how I have a specific campaign for the first in series and that I spend the bulk of my budget on that. On Facebook, I have a permanent, permanently running ad for my first in both the series. Um, and then I will only advertise a new release for the month when it's launched because I find that I haven't got as many new readers to find because that you're really only looking for people who've already read the other books in the series and making sure they know it's there. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it, it can be harder to measure the profitability of those ads because sometimes people will click on those ads and then they won't actually buy that book. They'll buy another book and so you don't know where those sales are going or they might buy nothing and <laughs> you have no way of knowing you know whether they bought nothing or whether they bought the first book um so yes i'll just run ads for the first month and then i'll stop them because they're you know, they're not profitable and i'm relying on read through instead mm -hmm. um, and in for that reason writing good books is really important and writing characters that people want to follow through multiple stories one of the things that's really interesting in crime is that people are actually more interested in the characters than they are in the mysteries as long as the mystery is coherent and makes sense and there are some twists and red herrings and so forth when you look at the reviews for crime books they tend to be less about the mystery and more about the characters and how people feel about the characters and that's something I learned when I was doing my market research and put a lot of focus into when I'm writing the books. And it helps me because they're, they're my imaginary friends, these people, and I enjoy writing about them. So that's fun. <laughs> um, did you revise any of your earlier series, uh, rewrite them now that, you know, knowing what you know now, did you go back and, and rework them? I did rework. There was one book that I, it was actually the... Actually, it wasn't the first book I wrote, but it was the first book I actually published purely because of publishing schedules and editing. And I went back to that after about oh, a couple of years and did an edit on it. Um, I did it only because it was the first in a series and I wanted to increase the number of people who might come into that series because the second and third books in the series I'd written quite a while later and I felt they were better books. But generally I wouldn't do that. I'm more of a believer in using what you learn about craft in the next book rather than going back to the last book because otherwise you can go round and round in circles and never produce another book. It's actually more important to keep writing and write better stuff next time. Um. We talked a little bit, so we talked uh, a good bit about uh, market research. Um, if somebody's very new to this and they're like, I know nothing about marketing, what are the first like three steps they should take in order to do market research for the genres that they want to, to write in? Yeah, I think the first thing is to choose your genre wisely. And I think of it as the Venn diagram of genre. 
in that there are three things you need to consider. The first one is what do you enjoy reading? Because if you don't enjoy reading it, you're unlikely to enjoy writing it, particularly if you find success and you're doing it for the rest of your career. The second one is what do readers love reading? So what is there a market for and what can you clearly identify that people like? And part of that is, is having a well-defined genre, not trying to mix up genres like I did at the beginning. And then the third one is what are you good at writing? So for me, when I was looking at what type of mystery to write, I chose to write police procedurals because I enjoy writing twists and I enjoy writing suspense and I'm good at those. They're my real strengths. Um, whereas cozy mysteries have different strengths that you would need to play to and that's less my skill set. So I, I found a genre that I enjoyed reading because I've always, always read crime that I knew that there was an audience for and that also I knew I had the skills to write in. So I think picking that genre wisely is probably the first step. Um, and if you've already written your book, <laughs> it's sort of too late to do that. Um, I guess um, I, analyzing your comps, identifying who your comps are, because if, if you've written a book that doesn't fit squarely into a genre, you can still do some a degree of marketing for it if you can find other authors to target. Because in reality, that's actually what's more important is having those comps. That's what feeds the recommendations a lot of the time. But it's just that if you're in a genre, it's much easier to find those comps. Mm -hmm. um, so we did have some questions about, can you repeat the title of your upcoming book? Uh, the one on the writing one. Yes, the writing one. Five Steps to Author Success. And it'll be out on Christmas Eve. Perfect. Um, is it for pre-sale already? It is. It's on pre-order now in ebook. I, uh, there isn't a paperback pre-order, right. but it will be out in paperback on Christmas Eve as well. Awesome. Um, and then if somebody wants to follow up with you or get in touch with you, how do they do that? The best way is via my website, rachelmcclain.com where they can sign up to my newsletter and find out more about my books. And there are also links to my social media, uh, where on Facebook, I'm Rachel McLean. And on Twitter and Instagram, I'm Rachel McWrites. Okay. And I'm going to grab that right now and, and send it out uh, so that everybody has that. I can, if I can cut and paste, apparently. I'm struggling to do that. Uh, but give me just a second. And can I just apologize for the lighting here? Because it's slowly getting dark out of the window in front of me. <laughs> which I didn't anticipate when I first logged on that my face is getting darker <laughs> as we go through the webinar. Well, I don't know about your house, but it's starting to get really gloomy at my house. So I can understand. And with the shorter days, but Thank you so much for joining us today. You've been incredibly helpful. Um, it's been a great ride for you, I know, over the last couple of years. Um, and I'm sure we've got so much more to look forward uh, to from you. Thank you. It's been really good to come on. And I hope that my experience is useful for people. And as always, happy publishing. <laughs>